Last week, we talked about Daniel's first vision in Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel's first vision covered, if you can remember, a description of four different kingdoms. And these kingdoms, for Daniel, they were future. But for us, we live so many years after Daniel, they are past. We can see them in history. Well, at the end of his first vision, he mentioned that a ruler uh, is going to come out of ten other rulers. And we discussed the fact that this ruler that is going to arise out of these ten other rulers is still future for us. That person we have not seen in history yet. Well, uh, Daniel's second vision, which we're going to talk about tonight, gives us more information about this powerful future ruler, which we would call the Antichrist. So I want to have you read with me in your Bibles. I'm reading from Daniel chapter 8, and I'm going to try to read through most of the chapter. I'm going to read at least the first 12 verses. In the third year of King Belshazzar, Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that, I already, that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram, and I, ha I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw, threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It's pro it prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. 
Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the uh, sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot. He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. We're going to uh, stop there, and uh, we're going to continue reading a little bit later on in the evening. So I want for you to see the, the uh, introduction to this vision in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, In the third year of King Belshazzar. We remember that Daniel chapter 7, or maybe you don't remember, but it's still true. Daniel chapter 7, he referred to the first year of King Belshazzar's reign. Now he's talking to th about the third year. That's two years later, right? So he's talking two years after the first vision that he had that we talked about last week, the vision of the four beasts. Now he's going to have a vision of two beasts. So the timing is the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. The sequence, he said, I had a vision after the one I already had, which this was the second vision. So now Daniel describes the vi vision in verses 2 to 12. Daniel described his location. Now we're going to find out that this is a fact later on, but just trust me for now. Daniel was in Babylon. He wasn't transported somewhere else. Daniel physically was in Babylon. But, if you look at verse 2 carefully, in his vision, that means in his dream or in his thinking, he was in the citadel of Susa. That's not Babylon. That's Persia. That's several hundred miles away. And he says, in his vision, he was in the citadel or the high uh, outlook Tower of Susa in the province of Elam, and he was beside the Ulai Canal. These are all literal places in Persia, but Daniel wasn't there physically, but in his mind, in his dream, he was there. It's kind of like me. I can have a dream while I'm lying here in uh, Newman, California, and I can dream about being with my daughter in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm not actually there, but I'm thinking about being there, okay? That's what Daniel is experiencing here. So he described his location, and then he described what he saw. There was a ram with two horns. Now, I talked about this last week, and I'm going to repeat it again. Horns for the people of Israel meant strength, and it meant specifically leaders, political leaders, who had a lot of strength. That, that's what horns represent. And there was a ram with two horns, and it was standing beside the canal. It had two long horns. In other words, there were two well-established kings or leaders in this in this situation. It had two long horns. One horn was longer than the other. And we're going to find out a little bit later who those two horns were. So it grew up later. And it charged towards three points of the compass. It charged, and, and remember we're thinking of, of not Babylon, we're thinking of Persia. And it charged from Persia west. And if you look on your map, straight west of Persia, guess what you're going to find? Israel. 
So it charged from Persia west and north and south. So it's about to take over Israel, okay? And no animal could stand against it. No, none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased, and it became great. There was a great empire, a great kingdom, and it was characterized or symbolized by this ram with two horns. I'll give you a little clue. We're going to find out later. But I'll give you a clue. It's a, it's a kingdom that we already heard about in chapter 7. It's the Medes and the Persians. Okay? We'll find out that later, but I'm just cluing you in right now. So that's the ram with two horns. Second, he saw another animal. And the other thing I wanted to mention to you is, remember chapter 7? Th there were unrealistic animals, like we, we had, uh, it was a, a lion, I think it was, with, with uh, the wings of the eagle, and it had all kinds of unrealistic characteristics to these animals. That was chapter 7, unrealistic uh, pictures. But they were vivid pictures at the same time. They, they were showing truth, but they were animals that you don't see every day, okay? Now he's talking realistic pictures of animals. So it's a little bit different. So th this a ram with two horns, you can easily see that anywhere. Second, <laughs> second there were <coughs> was a goat with a prominent horn. That means he had one horn, not two. It kind of looks like a unicorn, right? Okay. So look at verse 5 to 8. The horn was between his eyes, and it came from the west. Remember what we heard about the, the uh, ram. The ram was heading west. This uh, goat came from the west. So they're going towards each other, guess what? There's going to be a collision, right? You can just imagine that. It came from the west. It crossed the earth without touching the ground. Do you know what it's trying to communicate there? It's trying to communicate great speed. It, it was going so fast that it was like a hovercraft. It didn't quite touch the ground. You know? it, it's, we say that even today. That kid ran to me like he never touched the ground, you know. That's what we mean, great speed. And that's what he's saying here. It, it uh, crossed the earth without touching the ground. It charged at the two-horned ram. I told you there was going to be a collision. It charged with the two-horned ram with great rage, and it attacked the ram furiously. It struck the ram, shattering its two horns, so the two great leaders, Mede and Persian, are going to be destroyed. And the ram was powerless to stand against it. And the goat knocked it to the ground and trampled it. None could rescue from the ram or its power. The goat became very great. The one large horn was broken off. Four prominent horns grew up to take its place, and they shattered, or they scattered toward the four winds of the earth. I'll give you a little clue again. He's talking about Greece. So you're talking about the Median Persian Empire, and he's talking about the Greece Empire. Back in chapter 7, he used different animals to describe these two, two empires, but here in chapter 8, he's changing the picture for a very specific reason. So, in the first, uh, in the first eight verses, then, we have these two animals coming at each other. 
the ram with the two horns, and the goat coming from the west. Then we get to verse 9 to 12. There was another horn. It started small, but it grew in power toward the southeast and west, and it says toward the beautiful land. What is the beautiful land? Israel. That's what Daniel thinks is the beautiful land. Remember, he's been away from home in exile for 70 years. And when he thinks about home, that is the beautiful land. Okay? So this other horn, it was another horn that started small but grew in power towards the south, east, and west. It grew until it reached the stars of the heavens. And if you look at both Revelation and Daniel, the stars of the heavens is talking about angels. Angels. It grew until it reached the stars of the heaven, and it threw some of the stars down and trampled them. And if you read in Revelation chapter, I think it's 13 or 14, there was a third of the angels that were thrown down from heaven. Okay? It grew until it reached the stars of the heavens, and it threw some of the stars down and trampled them. It, it set itself up as the commander of the host or the army of the Lord. Who is the commander of the host of the Lord? The Lord himself, right? So this leader, this horn that starts small but grows big, thinks he's so wonderful that he sets himself up as if he were God. Okay? It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord. What's the daily sacrifice? That's what the Jews did every day in the temple. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord. The Lord's sanctuary was thrown down. That means the building was destroyed. And the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. Question. Who are the Lord's people? Both Israel and when you look forward to the New Testament, the church. The Lord's people were given over to it. And if you believe in the pre-trib rapture, let me ask you this question. How can you be given over to the Antichrist if you're not here? So, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it, and it prospered in all it did. In other words, it became very, very great. Everything it did seemed to prosper. And then it says something very important. Truth was, was thrown to the ground. Nobody believed in truth anymore. Does that sound similar to our day and age? Truth was thrown to the ground. And that's all because of this little horn. And while the other two animals are historic countries, we talked about Medo-Persia and we talked about Greece, this little horn is the Antichrist who is yet future. We haven't seen him, and I, I say that with a qualification. Some people look at this text, and they say, if you read the, the apocryphal books, the books that isn't in the Bible, but it was added to the Catholic Bible, if you read the apocryphal book Maccabees, you will read about Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes went and destroyed the Lord's temple. You know how he did it? He brought a, p 
pig into the temple as a sacrifice. And that was considered an abomination. You never do that. And because of that, the Lord's altar and everything was thrown down. The problem is Antiochus Epiphanes didn't fulfill this prophecy because the Lord hasn't come yet. You and I are still here. So Antiochus Epiphanes was a picture of this character to come, but Antiochus Epiphanes didn't fulfill this prophecy. Some other people say, well, Titus in 70 AD, when he went into the temple and destroyed it and destroyed the rest of Jerusalem, maybe he was uh, this Antichrist. Well, we've got the same problem. You and I are still here. Jesus hasn't come yet. It couldn't be have happened in 70 AD. I believe that Antiochus Epiphanes is an Old Testament picture and Titus is a New Testament times picture of the Antichrist who's still coming in the future. Does that make sense? So, then we get to verse 13, and I'm going to continue reading at verse, thir uh, four, actually, we're, I'm going to continue verse 15 because that's where we uh, ended off. So, Daniel 8, verse 15. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there stood before me one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. That means he fell face down to the ground. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the, ap the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. I told you it did, right? That's where I got it from. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece. That's where I got that one from. And the large horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns re that replace the one was broken, that was broken off represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a stern-faced king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong but, will, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The, vi the vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given to you is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. When I got up, 
and went about the king's business. Then I went, got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. When he says he got up and did the king's business, what king is he talking about? Look at verse 1, King Belshazzar. That's why I believe he was still in Babylon. Okay? So let's go back to verse 13, and let's talk about what Daniel described, how Daniel described the inter interpretation. He heard two holy ones speaking in verse 13. One asked the question, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? What's it, how, how long is this going to last? How long will it take for the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrendering of the uh, sanctuary, and the trampling of the Lord's holy people? When will that happen and how long will it be? And uh, the answer is given by the other angel in verse 14. It will take 2,300 years evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconstructed. Now, 2,300 evenings and mornings, what in the world did that mean? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice something. The first six days of the week, you notice that it says evening and morning? It doesn't say morning and evening. It says evening and morning. Why would it do that? And I asked the question from a boy who grew up in Canada and lives the in, in the United States of America, and we always say that the day begins in the morning, right? I'm not Jewish. If I was Jewish, I would know that the new day begins at 6 o'clock in the evening. And it goes till 6 o'clock the next day. So th this is a Jewish understanding of a literal day. Just like in Genesis, the six days, I know a lot of people disagree with me, but the six days of Genesis is a Jewish understanding of a 24-hour day. It's not thousands of years, like some people say. So understand this. There are 2,300 days, literal days, that he's talking about. So I got my calculator out. And because of something I already studied in chapter 9, I know that there's going to be an end time period of seven years. So I thought, how many days are in seven years? You know how many days are in seven? And again, I'm not Jewish. So I think the days of a year are 365. But the Jewish people don't think that way. For the Jewish person, a, a year is 360 days, not 365. So th th think with me on this. When you multiply 360 days times 7, you get to, I believe it's 2,520. I think, I think that's the right number. And you subtract 220, and you get this number, 2,300. I think what he is saying is that when the tribulation, what we call the tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel, when that starts, there will be 220 days for the Jewish people to put up their sanctuary, however it looks. 220 days. And then... From that to the time when the sanctuary starts until the end of the seven-year period is 2,300 days. And th that's the time period 
in which these things are going to happen. The daily sacrifice will be thrown down. The rebellion that causes desolation will happen. The, the sanctuary or surrender of the sanctuary and the trampling of the Lord's people. Does that make sense? So it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, I know there are other interpretations out there. There's a guy on YouTube that says we have to understand that every day is a thousand years. And therefore, if you start when Daniel lived up till now, you get to 1944, and that's when Jesus came back. There's a guy on the YouTube that's telling you that. I'm sorry, folks. He's wrong. Let's stay with literal days and let's stay with the ideas that Daniel has in this book and in this passage. Okay. So he talks about the timing. Then he says he heard a man's voice, verse 15 and 16. I was trying to understand the vision and someone stood before me who looked like a man. He wasn't a man, he was an angel, but he looked like a man. And he heard the man's voice from the Ulai, from the canal that he's standing by, saying, Gabriel, tell us the meaning of the vision. So we are getting the interpretation of this vision from the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel is the one who came to Mary in Luke chapter 2, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. So Gabriel tells the man the meaning of the vision, and he says, he came near to the place where Daniel was standing, and Daniel was terrified, and he was so afraid that he fell prostrate. If you read about Mary, when she met up with Gabriel, she was afraid too. And Gabriel spoke to Daniel, son of man, that means human being, understand that the vision concerns when? A few years down the road? No, no, no. It concerns the time of the end. That's why I don't believe with some other people that the vision is about Antiochus Epiphanes. That's why I don't believe with some other people that the vision is about 70 A.D., I believe that it concerns the time of the end because that's what Gabriel says. It concerns the time of the end. And he described his position, uh, Daniel describes his position in verse 18. I was deep in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And Gabriel touched me and raised me to my feet. So he's in a, he's in a very humble position. And Gabriel comes and touches him. And then he heard more of Gabriel's explanation in verses 19 to 26. Gabriel told Daniel what will happen in the time of wrath. That's the end time wrath of God. It's also known in other uh, books of the Bible as the day of the Lord. The vision had he had concerned the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram represented the kings of Media and Persia. And remember it said that one horn was greater than the other? Persia was greater than Media, but they were all both worked together. And he said, the shaggy goat represents the king of Greece, and the large horn is the first king. Do you know who the first king of Greece was? Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was such a powerful leader king that he conquered almost the whole world. And he was 33 years old and he was discouraged. And he said, I've conquered the world. There's nothing left to conquer. What do I do now? <laughs> you know what he did? He died. So, so uh, the first king was Alexander the Great. But you know what happened when Alexander died? There were four families that took over. Some people say, well, there were five empires. Well, yes, there were five empires, 
but they came from four families. One family was divided in two. So this is the four kings or the four horns that represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation. Daniel is predicting what for him was hundreds of years in the future. For us, we can look back at it, it's history. But for him, it's hundreds of years in the future. And he's pre pre predicting it accurately because it's not his ideas, it's God's ideas that were given to him. And guess what? Remember that I said a long time ago that God is the great I am? And that I am means he's, in the, he's present in the past, he's present in the present, and he's present in the future. So for God to tell the future is simply for God to know what's already happening, because he's there. So that's how, it, how come it's so accurate. And by the way, many uh, unbelieving scholars say Daniel didn't actually write this book. It was written 300 years later when people could know what happened. Well, that's a bunch of baloney. Anyways, so it says the four horn, horns represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation. Then there will be another king. And this is when the separation happens, when that which is history is history, and that which is future for us still happens. There will be another king, and this will happen when rebels have become completely wicked. Do you think our world is a bunch of rebels who have become completely wicked? I think we're getting close. There will be a man who will be a master of intrigue. He is a genius. He is a conniver. He knows how to make people agree with him, even though he's not always going to do it their way. He's going to get people to support him. It's not a Democrat. It's not a Republican. It's a super leader who's from another area of the world, most likely Turkey. And I'll tell you why I believe that later. So, <laughs> uh, he will be a master of intrigue. He will become very strong, but do you notice what it says? Not by his own power. That's a Bible way of saying he will be empowered by demonic, satanic power. Okay? And there's another statement a little bit later that says he will be strong not by his own power, and that's about, about God's power, but that's coming later. It's just a parallel of opposites, actually. So he will become very strong not by his own power, he will be become strong by demonic power, and he will cause devastation, but he will succeed. Most kings, if they cause devastation, that's the start of their downfall, but even though he causes devastation, he's going to rise above it, and he's going to succeed in what he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. Many of God's people will be destroyed in persecution by this evil man, this evil leader. And he will cause deceit to prosper. That means people will believe lies. And lies will be the main thing that people believe. He will consider himself to be superior. I'm better than any other leader that's ever existed. And when they feel secure, you know what, in, from other passages we know, this man will come and have a peace treaty for Israel and all the problems that Israel's having now, there's going to come a man who will have a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians, and the people of Israel will feel secure. Now we have peace. We have a seven-year treaty that we can bank on. 
And look what it says. When they feel secure, he will destroy many. He will make everybody think, we've got a peace treaty. We can relax. We can enjoy prosperity. And then they're going to die. He's got them trapped. He will take his stand against the prince of princes. You know who the prince of princes is? We're talking Jesus. He will take his stand against Jesus Christ, and he will be destroyed, but not by his own power. He will be destroyed, how? By God's power. So you have this this, uh, contrast. He will become great, but not by his power, but by the devil's power, and then he will be destroyed, not by his power, but by God's power. And the vision of evenings and mornings, listen to this, the vision is true. Don't let people say that Daniel was hallucinating and didn't know what he was talking about. And there are writers that say that. The vision is true. You can count on this vision. And this is a reference back to verse uh, 14. In verse 14, It talked about the time period of evenings and mornings. The vision of evenings and mornings is true. But he said, and again, this is Gabriel talking to Daniel, but seal up the vision because it concerned the distant future. Daniel wasn't supposed to tell this to everybody in Babylon at the time. He was supposed to seal it up. And that's why you and I have the book of Daniel safe now, because he didn't blab it all over Babylon back then. He kept it sealed up, and the Hebrew people took it with them, and they put it in their scriptures. Seal up the vision. It concerns the distant future. Then in verse 27, and I close, Daniel was worn out. Just watching the vision wore him out. I don't know if you feel that way, but that's how he, that's kind of the dream he had. It wore him out. He was exhausted for several days. But after he was exhausted, he got up and he served King Belshazzar and he was appalled by the vision. He couldn't even, he couldn't even believe that such an evil character would ever exist. He did not understand it. And you know, that kind of comforts me. If so many years after Daniel wrote this vision, I don't understand every detail of it, I'm kind of comforted. Well, Daniel didn't understand it either. But listen, someday, there are some things we do understand. There is going to come a very evil leader, and he's still in the future. And this evil leader will stand against God by the power of the devil. And then he will be destroyed by the power of God. Even though I don't understand all the details, I believe that's going to happen. And it might not be the distant future for us. It was the distant future for Daniel, but it might happen very soon for you and me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this record that we have of Daniel's vision way back then. And how, even though we don't understand it all, we do understand a big part of it, that there's going to come an evil person who's going to be very, very sly and who's going to deceive many people. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. And if we're faithful to you, you have said in your word that we will not be deceived. Lord, Keep us true to you so that we're not deceived by the Antichrist and that we live to see the day when we get to see you face to face. That will be a wonderful day. Thank you for this vision and help us to ponder it and to study it so that we can understand the times that we are living in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.